If you have your Bibles, go to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua 6. The plan at the moment is that Obviously, we'll teach this, that wraps up this, unless I decide to go back and do a full review, which I'm not planning on at the moment. Um, subject to change without notice. Um, but then to take a couple of weeks, maybe as many as four weeks, going back to the names of God, names and titles of God. Um, looking at that, if you remember back a year ago, uh, we used that as a short kind of between series lessons, and we've done that uh, probably three times since then, and we're going to do that again. Um, take at least two weeks, maybe four, and look at that, um, the names of God, looking at some of the titles. Uh, when I say titles, some of them are titles that, uh, if you look in the scripture, it's a proper title with a capital letter. Uh, there's a lot that are titles that God gives. It's not necessarily truly a title as much as it is a descriptor. For instance, when he says, I am your shield and buckler. It's not a proper title, but there's a meaning behind it, and we're going to look at some of those. And so, uh, still looking at, uh, we made one deviation from that. At Christmas, we looked at names of Christ. For the most part, every time we've looked at it, it's been the names or descriptors, titles of the Father. And we're still going to stay with those. Um, it's not an inexhaustible list. But it's a pretty big list, a really big list. And so uh, as we get into the terms that God uses to describe himself, uh, it helps us, and I've mentioned this each time we've been in it, the names that God uses for himself help us to better understand him. He uses those names. Uh, he's got names that he gave to himself one time, found once in scripture. Well, why not use another one this morning? Because this one says something unique about him. It's there for a reason. And so that's kind of the plan. Uh, today, we'll finish up the Jordan River Rules. I'm not planning on a full review, but there is that slight chance. Um, but then we'll spend a few weeks looking at the names of God. And then probably, just to go ahead and finish out what's here, I'd mentioned back about the time we got into this that uh, Robert Morgan had put out a new book, The Mediterranean Sea Rules. Um, I have not yet read that. It's the same size. It's about yay big. Um, it's the same size. I haven't read it yet, so I want to read through it real quick, but that would be pretty much a sit down and read, get up for lunch, and you're done. I mean, it's, it's short. And so I'll look at that, but that's probably the plan uh, is to look at that and then take 10 weeks there. So I kind of give you the short-term uh, plan for the class. Joshua chapter 6. We looked at the first couple of verses. We're rolled in with chapter 5. If you remember last week, we said, please ignore the chapter division. In that case, it wasn't supposed to be there. Um, but it was. So I think we are, uh, chapter 6, verse 6. Um, and Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city. Let him that is armed pass on before the Ark of the Lord. Now, this isn't a big part of the lesson, but look at verse 8. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests, and we'll sum it up in, in one word, obeyed. Um, look at verse 9. And the armed men went before the priests. Well, that's what Joshua had just said. And so I think verse 10 is really interesting, and that's we will make note of it as we go through the lesson. Look at verse 10. And Joshua commanded the people, saying, you shall not shout, nor make any noise. Whoa, time out. Anyhow, you shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about at once, and they came into camp and lodged in the camp. And verse 12, they rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark. Um, this is the old uh, wash, rinse, repeat. And they do that for six days. And on day seven, it's repeat, 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 repeat. Seven times they repeat. 
and look, drop all the way down to verse 15. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And we'll pause right there. Um, the instructions that are given are unique. First of all, when we mentioned this last week, Joshua was a military commander. He had led the people in battle numerous times. Last week we saw he crosses over the river and he's kind of contemplating and looking at Jericho and, hey, who's this guy with the sword drawn looking at me? And this guy says, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua says, oh no. <laughs> Joshua bows down and we see here that this person doesn't say get up. He allows Joshua to worship, which is very important. And he gives Joshua the instructions for how to take the city. Joshua relays now these instructions to the people. I mentioned last week, Joshua probably was like, are you sure about that? Now you have the people who have been out to do battle numerous times. They have fought and defeated enemies along the way. And now they're coming to Jericho, this great walled city. And Joshua says, here's the plan. We're going to go for a walk. Okay. And then we're going to go back and make camp. And tomorrow, guess what we're going to do? We're going to go for a walk. I mean, think about this. From a military standpoint, this makes zero sense. But what we have to remember, uh, it's a, verse 16 is where I see it immediately right here. So look at verse 16, the very last statement. Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. It is not the people and their marching and shouting that is going to accomplish anything. It is God. And that's what is important to be understood here. Well, we're looking at lesson 10 here. Um, encircle obstacles with biblical faith. Um, understand that what God has said, God can do, God is capable of doing. However we want to word that, what God has said will come to pass. And yet, we go into the New Testament, and Jesus is talking, and he says something about faith, the, grain of, the size of the grain of a mustard seed. So we sometimes may struggle with our faith, because I know how life goes, and God says, but you don't know how I go, but I'm going to show you. And so, biblical faith. And then, that second part here, and shout the victory. When the people get done marching on day seven, they're to shout. And this isn't a shout to see what's going to happen. This is a shout because of what's going to happen. They've already been told. God will give you the city. That faith is wrapped up in that portion as well. Uh, I'm going to run through this quick. We've been looking at all these. Um, last week, the last lesson that we looked at was you're not in charge. Remember who is. Uh, we like to be in charge. Um, I don't know what your life is like at work. You may be the boss. You may have, have a boss or you may be in a position where you've got many bosses and you hope they're all on the same page on the same day. Uh, where you have many bosses, and every time one walks by, they give you different instructions. Okay, uh, With God, I don't have to deal with that. I know God's plan. I don't know God's plan way down the road. I need to know what is God's plan right now. That's all I need to worry about. Sometimes we get really focused on, what am I going to do in five years? Heavens, I need to be more worried about what I'm going to do in five minutes. And so if I take care of this, this five minutes and then the next five minutes, when I look back in five years, I'll look back and see I was right where I was supposed to be. I'm not in charge. I simply have to figure out how to obey. And that is a, that's a lifetime chore. I need to know how to do what God wants me to do when God wants me to do it the way God wants me to do it. I'm not in charge. He is. Well, they're going around the city. They're going full circle. 
when you see a, a, a movie and people are lost in the woods, they're walking around aimlessly, and there's usually a line something like, this looks familiar, I think we've been here before. Children of Israel, they're marching and marching and marching. Now, I doubt that there are markers on the side of the wall that say, hey, 500 more yards and you'll be back where you started. But they go marching, 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 and I think that's where we started here. Now, the other thing is, we talked about this was a huge group of people. What are the chances that person number one in line, when it gets around the city, sees person number last in line right in front of them? Every one of those persons needs to do exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, William Cowper, hymn writer. Victory comes when we cooperate with God, when we seek to do things his way. And Cowper says, God moves in a mysterious way. We talked about that hymn weeks ago. God moves in, a mysteri in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He knows what he's going to do. And so often God chooses to do what he's going to do in a way that only he can get the credit. God doesn't give his, share his glory with another, and God doesn't want us to credit another when he's done a marvelous work. God wants us to recognize it is he and he alone who has done this. God moves in a mysterious way. And victory comes when we cooperate. And we need to understand that he's going to do things in his time. You ever known somebody, maybe the guy you see in the mirror, that wants to rush ahead of God and get things done, like right now when God says, slow down? God wants to do things in his time. God wants to do things his way. God doesn't have to operate like you and I do. God doesn't operate like you and I do. And God's going to use his methods, his means. Victory comes when we cooperate with God. That means I need to be willing to work in his time to do things his way to follow and allow him to use his methods. And that can be a challenge at times. And so they're going full circle. Oh, they're, they're walking around the city. And yet they have been already told what the final outcome is going to be. Just like they did, so we need to claim the victory. We have these obstacles. They are just that. They are obstacles. And yet I serve a God who is greater than any obstacle that I'm going to face. That doesn't mean that he is going to resolve this issue the way I think it needs to be or should be resolved. And that could be a challenge. Because I want things done my way and I want them done my way right now. And God says, eh, no, I want you to have faith, but I'm still in charge. Now, faith is not presumption. Uh, there's a hymn, um, we've sung it a couple of times, uh, Living by Faith. That's easier to sing than it is to practice. And yet, it's very true, that's what we need to do. And one of the great examples, and I, I don't have time to go into the story, it would be fantastic, uh, but I've got the, George Mueller there uh, from Bristol, England, a bazillion years ago, or so it seems like, um, who lived 100% completely by faith and saw God do great and marvelous things as he ran an orphanage in England with no means of support other than God, who is a very sufficient means of support. There's a... a Kids Sunday school song 
He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills. What is it? The sun and moon that shine or something like that. Um, he owns it all. He even owns what might be in my bank account and yours. He has the means to meet my needs. And George Mueller is such a fantastic example of that. If you're not familiar with Mueller, I would encourage you to try to find a biography and read it. Not the big 500-page biographies, but find a, find a biography. And, and you'll see a man who was completely devoted to doing God's work, God's way, and wanted God to show himself to be strong and mighty on their behalf. And guess what God did? God is up to any challenge. He's not up to presumption. When I want to play games with God, he's not interested. But if I want to truly live by biblical faith, God is all about meeting my needs and providing. And so he, I had this thought as I was working on this, and so the thought shows up in your notes there. Uh, if I step out by faith, what do I really expect is going to happen? If I'm going to step out by faith, what are my expectations? Am I really stepping out by faith if the whole time I know it's not going to work? We often trust God, but do we really? I'm trusting God even as I make a contingency plan. I have alternate plan B in my back pocket because I'm ready just in case God can't work this one out. I mean, think about it for a moment. We, we, we've grown up with such a mindset that says, I need to make sure that I take care of X. That I spend my time making sure that I take care of X and don't give God a chance to do what God wants to show me that he can do. Does our trust make its way to practical application in our lives? <coughs> I trust God. Okay, how is that demonstrated in my life? One of the problems that we see in American Christianity is that our young people don't see that we truly trust God. And so they're growing up not trusting him either. I mean, what we see in churches across America, there is a dearth of that size people or that size people. And they're looking for something that's more interesting and exciting. Perhaps even in a church. Why? Because they've never seen God really work. All they've done is see mom and dad try to figure out how to solve the problem. If I really trust God, does that make its way into practical living? Well, faith isn't practical. But if I explain biblically why I'm doing this, then it might make a difference. How is our faith put into practice? We talked a couple of weeks ago about the importance that we have of teaching that next generation. They're not going to learn it on their own. And they're absolutely not going to learn it watching the news. And they're not going to learn it listening to a teacher who may be ungodly. They're going to learn it from mom and dad and grandpa and grandma and aunts and uncles who are committed to faithfully following after God. And so if we're going to live by faith, then we need to dive into the word of God and find and claim God's promises. When God tells the people of Israel here, you're going to march around the city and you're going to do this for seven days. And on day seven, you're going to march seven times. And then I am going to give you the city. They needed to take that promise and claim that promise and obey because this is what God told them to do. <clears throat> Some of the promises we, in scripture, we see in Scripture are not for us, but many are. There are a great many that are for There were some that were, if you want to say, limited to the children of Israel. There are some promises that may have been limited to uno person. But there's a great many that are right there for us. Do we get into the Word of God and look for those promises? We need to search and study the Scriptures. 
Search the scriptures. I loved the, and it's a, a very brief story. In Acts, what is it, Acts 1711? Talks about the, the people of Berea. So there's, these were no, more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures to see whether those things were so. Paul comes into the city. Think about this. Paul, the apostle, the one that we put up on the big pedestal, okay? Powerful preacher. Comes into the city. He preaches. The people of Berea says, let me make sure he's right. Wow. There's an example for us. Let's search the scripture and find the promises, study the scripture so that we know what those promises mean, and then we know how to apply those promises. We need to claim these promises. If, if those promises are for us, let's claim those promises if they apply to this issue or the obstacle that we're dealing with here. Claim the promises biblically. And sometimes we finish right back where we started. I think I've been here before. And we may ask ourselves, what did this really accomplish? Now here's the question. How do we judge success? After day six, do you think some of the people in Israel had a question as to what they were really accomplishing here? If they're anything like me, I don't know about you, anything like me, it's like, what is the point? What is the goal? We're going to dig a trench as we walk around and hope that the walls just fall down because we wore this trench out? Wore their foundation down? I mean, I mean, think about it for a moment. If they are normal people, after six days of walking around the city in silence, why? What are we really accomplishing here? Because the question is, how do we judge success? I can tell you, it's probably a little different than God judges success. And yet God is looking for faithfulness. He's looking for those ones who will faithfully obey and do what he's told them to do. Now, I think there is a typo in the next word. Should, oops because I've got a typo on my slide, should say faithfulness. And I think it just says fullness in yours. Okay? Should be faithfulness, which is obedience one step at a time, and then take the next step. Faithfulness isn't finishing the race. Faithfulness is taking the next step, and all those next steps will help me to finish the race. If I don't take the next step, I can't finish the race. My concern isn't the finish line. My concern is the next step. Um, attending a small Christian school, I had the blessed opportunity to run track, and I am not a track person. Give me a stick and a ball, and I'm good to go. Put me on the track. Tortoise, hare, then me. Okay? Um, I always was intrigued in track, and I didn't run a lot, tried not to. Uh, I was always intrigued by the people who run hurdles. All it takes is for them to get their steps off by six inches, and it's face plant time. They clip the top of the hurdle, and down they go. Some of them don't go down, but their steps are off, and now every hurdle's going down. They may keep their balance kind of as they hit the top, but they don't have time to stop and take their steps and get them right again, and their steps are off, and every hurdle's getting clipped. Faithfulness is one step at a time. If you get too fast, too slow, those hurdles are going to reach up and bite you. I need to be willing to take my steps in God's time, in God's way, using God's methods. It's the only way I'm going to get through the obstacles that this life throws at me. Faithfulness. And then, point three. Interesting word here. Not a word you were expecting in this one. So far, so good. Now, uh, now you may know what the shofar is. Talks about it here. That's your trumpets. Um, 
It talks about the fact that they marched seven times. The priests blew with their trumpets. People shouted. Let's jump over to Hebrews 11. Keep your place here. We'll be back. Hebrews 11. Looking really at just one verse here. This is your faith chapter. All these people, they, some of them accomplished great things, some of them accomplished things. Look at verse 30. One short little verse, two lines in my Bible, probably two lines in yours, maybe stretches into a third, depending on your print. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. As God looks back now and gives commentary, there's no additional information given. It wasn't like Joshua 6 left out something. The people marched, the walls fell down. As God looks back on it now, and through the writer of Hebrews pens this for us, the people marched, compassed, the walls fell down. There's no catapult, there's no battering ram, there's no, they did what God said, and looking back, God gives the commentary that they did what God said. That was it. Obstacles are nothing more than opportunities, opportunities for God to show who he is. Opportunities to see God work. Opportunities for us to demonstrate our faith. When we face an obstacle, we have an opportunity to demonstrate, maybe to kids, grandkids, nieces, or nephews, we have an opportunity to demonstrate what biblical living is all about. Obstacles are nothing but opportunities. God's opportunities. We talked there in that title about encircling the obstacles. Um, we said encircle them with, with faith. Now we're going to look at a, a, a few other terms here. Encircle them with power. Power found in the presence of the Almighty. When I am in the presence of God, I have His power available at my disposal. He doesn't use it flippantly or haphazardly, but God is quite willing to use His power for His people. He is omnipresent. Obviously, omnipotent fits in here. We're talking about power, but we're talking about power within the presence. God is there. Do I acknowledge his thereness? God is here. He's here with us today. Do I acknowledge that? Do I live with that mindset that he is ever present with me? And we've mentioned this a couple of times over the last few weeks, the idea that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Lo, I am with you all the way. The fact that God has made it clear He's right here with us. Do I understand that? Do I live with that mindset? Do I sense his presence? And the last one, there, there's no blank here. You can read it and see what it says. Do I take comfort in his presence? The fact that God is ever present with us should give me great comfort. Whatever I am going through, even when there's nobody else around, I'm not going through it alone because God is ever present with me. That should be comforting. The old, the old spiritual, nobody knows that, you know what, God does. God does because he's right here with me. Encircle your obstacle with power, a power that comes when I understand that God is ever present with me. We cannot escape his presence. It's interesting. I, don't, I didn't put the passage down. You can look it up if you want to. The psalmist said, you know, where, where, where can I go to get away from the presence of God? He says, I, I went up, I went down, I went over, I went there. I can't. He's there. Our omnipresent God is omnipotent. So he's not only always there, but he's always there and always powerful. All powerful. And he can accomplish whatever he says or chooses to do. 
So I need to live with that presence in mind, and that presence should help me to understand that he can do it. Encircle your obstacle with prayer. Prayer. Now, this, and I, I've mentioned this already, but uh, this daily march is completed in silence. I mean, you, you look at this. I'm back here in Joshua chapter 6 now. And we mentioned this. We looked at verse 10. Neither sh uh, you shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth. Can't even get that to happen with one small class of middle schoolers. How are you going to do that with a line of people where you can't see the beginning from the end? They have to obey. It has to be in silence. You know, sometimes we get distracted by the noise of the world, don't we? Um, we get focused on what we're doing, and next thing you know, we've lost focus because somebody's doing something else. Um, James said, let every man be swift to hear, slow to... Be quiet, pay attention to what's going on. That's basically what Joshua tells the people here. The daily march is completed in silence. I need to be able, willing to focus, to set aside those distractions. I need to focus on the task at hand. I don't know. There are people who have tried to take their best guess at how big this city was at this time. Now, Jericho, there, there, there's still a city of Jericho today. Okay. Jericho, if I'm not mistaken, is the oldest continually inhabited city on the planet. If not, it's one of them. I mean, it is, it is that old. But trying to identify how large was this city physically at this point, it's not like, again, it's not like they put a marker out there. God didn't tell us the city was X number of you know, yards around or cubits around. But it was not like walking around the property of the church here. How long did it take to walk around? I don't know. But these people have to set aside the distractions and focus upon what God has told them to do. Now, we're talking about prayer. Communication is bi-directional. God speaks to us through his word and through the spirit. We need to be ready, willing, and able to speak to him through prayer. Communicate. Prayer is nothing more than talking to God. Um, well, bow your head and close your eyes as you're driving down 83 at rush hour. Maybe not. Head up, eyes wide open. And you're asking God for safety from all these people who don't know how to drive but still have their license. And I could go into my whole discourse on people in modern cars, but I won't do that. I don't have time. Um, but seriously, communication is bi-directional. I need to be willing to converse with God. Now, he's not going to speak with me as a man speaks with a friend. We saw that in Scripture. But that's not how it works today. He speaks to me through the Word and through the leading of the Spirit. I need to be willing to speak to him. I need to pray. Encircle your obstacles with prayer. Encircle your obstacles with promises. We talked about promises a little bit ago. Search the scripture. Find out what God has said and understand then that that is what God will do. Search the scripture to find the applicable promises. What promises are there that would relate to what you're dealing with, what you're going through, what you need? Search, study, and then meditate, ponder, reflect. Think about. Meditate. Talks to us, uh, the scriptures talk to us in, uh, in Luke chapter 2, after the shepherds come and go. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them. What did she do? She meditated. She was thinking about them. We find Joshua in chapter 1 talks about meditation, about thinking, about studying. We need to be a people who will, again, going back to that last point, 
set aside the distractions and let our mind mull over the things of the Word of God, the promises that are here. We need to encircle our obstacles with perseverance. Perseverance. The first time we run into a difficulty, we don't, oh, well, I tried. I'll sit back and wait and see what somebody else can do with it. Perseverance. Uh, the journey around the city, again, probably wasn't just like walking around the property here, but at the same time, it wasn't like marching all the way across the wilderness. That part was done. And the journey around the city was probably not too terribly difficult. I mean, it wasn't like there was a sidewalk out there. And there may have been a little bit of rough terrain, but it wasn't like they were going up and down mountains. They just crossed over what? Crossed through, actually. They crossed the Jordan River. So they're in a river valley. I mean, think geographically where they're at, what they're dealing with here. And yet, the journey around the city required faithful, consistent marching. Sometimes if the challenge isn't there, we get bored. You know what? Just keep going. But I don't like plodding. I want to do something different. And in this case here, it's just one, one step after another. One step after another. Where? All the way around the city. And then tomorrow we're going to do the same thing. Consistent marching. Perseverance. Keep after it. I've already marched five days. Can you take my turn today? I've been doing this for a long time. I'm ready to step down and let somebody else do it. Perseverance. We need perseverance in the, in the Christian life, don't we? We need people who are willing to just keep on keeping on. Keep doing what they've been asked to do. Encircle your obstacles with power, with prayer, with promises, with perseverance, with praise. Encircle your obstacles with praise. You know, we may very well be sometimes way too reserved in our faith. Now, I am not a yeller and a screamer. Never have been. Um, and I mentioned, I coached for a whole lot of years. My biggest problem with coaching is that my voice does not carry at all. If it weren't for this thing, y'all in the back couldn't hear me. Okay? My voice does not carry. But that doesn't mean I can't raise my voice. I mentioned before, I enjoy, I actually have on my calendar for Friday night to plant my seat in the seats at Williams Grove Speedway. And if the right guy wins, I will be excited. You know what? Living the Christian life and seeing it God at work ought make me excited. Sometimes we are way too reserved in our faith. Read through the scripture and see how many times it says something akin to shout for joy. May not be that exact wording, but something akin to that. Lift up your voices and sing. And it mentions here, I may get more excited with a sporting event, or you may get more excited with your hunting success than you do at seeing God's work in us and through us. We hear or see what the missionaries do, and blah, 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 blah. Right? Now, just a, a, a quick question. We know the answer. Which is going to have more long-lasting results? Lance DeWeese winning the race or the missionaries seeing folks come to Christ? There, there's not a huge question here. Which one's going to cause me to get more excited? I need to be willing to give God the praise that he so richly deserves for the work that he's doing in us and through us. A conclusion. I'll run out of time if I'm not careful here. Uh, way too often, we try to overcome our problems on our own. Again, we talked about that. I need to do things in his time, his way, his method. Uh, way too often, I want my time, my way, my method. And way too often, we try to get God to overcome our problems our way. Sometimes I try to overcome my problems 
my way. Sometimes I tell God he needs to overcome my problems, but I want him to do it my way. Never misuse the scripture. We talked about searching scripture, find the promises. But the scripture determines whether or not this applies to me and how it applies in this situation. I don't. I can't take the scripture and twist it to make it work for me right now. I trust God even when things seem pointless. We're marching around the city right back where we started again. You know what? Each step of the way was important, and each day the steps of that day were important. They're not going to get to the end of lap seven on day seven if they don't take lap one on day one. And they're not going to finish lap one on day one if they don't take the next step. Each step is important. But I don't see the reason for it. I don't need to see the reason for it. Think, again, think back to the kids. Why do, we, why do I have to do this? I don't like because dad said, but sometimes trying to explain the reason to a 10-year-old is just a waste of time. Say, so, tell you what, ask me in a year and I'll try to explain it. Right now, it's, it's not going to make any sense to you. It may seem pointless. I still need to obey. So we have these obstacles, speed bumps. You ever seen somebody, they're going through the parking lot and they, they take the speed bump like it's a small, a small version of uh, Kilimanjaro? Like, you've got an SUV, what's the problem? As they creep over the speed bump. Okay, speed bumps may seem huge to some people. Hills? Mountains? Oh, mountains are mountains, right? Mountains are not mountains to God. I mean, think about it for a moment. He spoke them into existence. He could speak them out of existence. So these things that I think are problems in my life to God are nothing. I need to be ready and willing to attack these problems, attack them biblically. Uh, first of all, and this is going through the last main points that we saw there, with power, prayer, Attack him with promises. What does God say? How is God going to work here? Perseverance. Let's stick with it. And praise. I need to be willing to face up to these problems and deal with them. And I threw four songs in at the end here. Uh, there were more. Uh, faith is the victory. You know, sound the battle cry. Now, in the case of the Jews here, the sound the battle cry was at the end of the whole ordeal. But you still need, they still were told, okay, you sound that battle cry when it comes the right time. Soldiers of Christ arise. They get up in the morning, I don't feel like going out today. Get up, let's go do what we're supposed to do. And then one of the favorites within the church, victory in Jesus. These Jews could have attacked that city and sat there and beat against the wall for years. Victory only came from God himself. God gives us the victory. We have a God who helps us to get through the river and take the next obstacle that we face. He's ready and willing to do that, but we have to be ready and willing to trust him every step of the way and take that next step. The fact that I have victory today doesn't resolve tomorrow's problems. Guess what? Tomorrow's got its own fair share of problems. At work, you know. I'll be, be at work, and the guys that work for me will walk in. So what's it look like? I said, every day is a whole new adventure, buddy. <laughs> um, the fact that we loaded all the boxes yesterday means nothing today. They're coming right back to us. The fact that they made it through the river means nothing in regards to Jericho. The fact that they went around the city of Jericho means nothing with AI. AI? What happened there? I can't get presumptuous. I have to persevere in obedience, day after day, and trust that God will accomplish what he wants to do. Father, we thank you for the day and for your goodness to us. God, I ask that you would help us to trust you each and every step of the way. God, to do the things that you want done and to do them the way you want them done. Father, I ask you to be with the service to come, that you be with pastor, give him the words to say. Help us to set aside the distractions of this world, God, to focus upon you, to learn the lessons that you have for us and to put them to practice within our lives. And God, may we take advantage of the opportunities that we have to teach the next generation what biblical faith, biblical living is all about. And we ask this in your name, amen.